we will go on to our last speaker, and this is uh, Professor Dr. Martin Kunz from the University of Applied Science and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland. And he will talk about uh, monoacyllecetin and lecithin as interacting excipients in all bioenabling formulations of purely water soluble drugs. Please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm the last guy now between you and the coffee break, so I'll try to be. Uh, try to go not over time and uh, try to be in interesting. So I think it, my talk actually blends over quite nicely from Annette's talk because she already alluded to these uh, phospholipid amorphous complexes with an ilotinib and amphotericin. Um, and we have seen that it can also be an intermediate product. So I'm going to go on with this amorphous complexes. Um, the outline is as follows. I'll give a very brief introduction, followed then by um, talking a little bit about this interaction. So maybe we can touch upon the question we had also earlier about this, this type of interactions. Um, is there in silico guidance to formulators? Uh, do we get some help for what particular compounds? This, these are good options. We'll briefly touch upon drug release and, and on the level of drug release, we saw it's actually quite complex what kind of colloids you get. Uh, um, uh, again, Annette was talking about this. We also had in the other talks, of course, a bit of a glimpse of the complexity that is given on the colloidal level. And then the question is, can we model that? And I'll just very briefly touch upon that as well. All right. So first of all, if you do formulation development, now that sounds very basic, but I think it's very important because I've seen it also in my industrial years that it's not always the case that you first identify the biopharmaceutical hurdles. Uh, maybe you don't need a solid dispersion or you don't need a fancy uh, supersaturating drug delivery system. Maybe it's enough to just increase a little bit the intrinsic dissolution rate because it's dissolution limited. So really go according to the needs of your compound. Um, learn about what are the hurdles. Could it also be uh, permeability? Could that be your hurdle? What is the stability in GI fluids? Uh, there are some uh, flow charts out there in the literature that guide you. But in any case, it should be the biopharmaceutical and the FISCAM properties that are guiding the way to first identify what are viable formulation principles and then decide on the uh, formulation itself. As I said, I'm going to focus now only on one specific type of system, also for time reasons. Uh, I also share a passion for lipids like Annette in the, uh, for uh, self-emulsifying uh, drug delivery systems in particular. Um, now, the next slide is actually something that I could have also skipped entirely, but I still want to touch upon this. Um, with respect to the packing of these uh, excipients in colloids, it's of course the size of the head group as well as the size, the volume of the tail group that is decisive. And uh, with the diacylphosphatidylcholine, we have of course a much more bulky tail group um, that favors, as we all know, uh, bilayers and uh, pneumatic phases. It favors also vesicle formation, whereas uh, the monoacylphosphatidylcholine or lysophosphatidylcholine Oh yeah, there you can also get from the pack, critical packing parameter, you can get uh, the, the mice cells. Now this brings me now to the work um, that we did with these one-to-one, uh, -one, in this case, molar uh, mixtures. We then later also looked into other molar ratios, but let's get started with this. Yeah, which compounds actually form such a solid dispersion as opposed to others that do not? Um, this is the range. The uh, compounds we started with, um, this is not all of them, as I, uh, as I said, but this is at least how we got started. It was a solvent-based process that we used, so drug and phospholipids were uh, dissolved in a, in, a, uh, in a common solvent like ethanol or THL, F, and uh, then we looked at, after drying, we looked at the solid-state characteristics, if there is some crystallinity that can be found by XRPD, DSC or polarized light microscopy. And there are three things I'd like to uh, mention. Number one from the result is that these amorphous complexes are actually often obtained. Yeah? This is not something we knew earlier. So is this something that comes rarely or do you get this more often? But 
it's almost 50% if you would just by random uh, pick poorly soluble drugs that you do get amorphous complexes at the one-on-one -on -one molar ratio. The second point is there is a high overlap between the monoacyl phosphatidylcholine, the lysolecithin, and the diacyl. So they are very similar. It actually was just the naproxen from our first set of compound that made the difference because this was also working with a diacyl phosphatidylcholine. The third point that I would like to mention is the following. Since 2010, there was actually a nice paper from the Purdue University uh, characterizing drugs according to their tendency, to their own tendency, to come as amorphous form. So class one compounds are so-called fast crystallizers. They don't like the amorphous form per se. Class two are instable and class three are uh, glass formers. Now glass formers doesn't mean that you get per se a, a, a nice solid dispersion. You still need excipients like uh, polymers, but yeah, they, they basically uh, have a tendency to form amorphous, uh, uh, yeah, they are glass formers naturally. Now what does that mean if you're on the other side of the spectrum, if you have non-glass forming drugs that really like to crystallize directly from a super cold melt, for example? it's very hard to bring them to an amorphous product. And in fact, if you look at what is on the market, you will see that the majority of um, marketed products, almost all of them are good glass formers. So uh, there is maybe one or two exceptions. One is, for example, Vemura Finip, Zelborov from Roche. But uh, yeah, the others are good glass formers. And this third point was that even with the non-glass formers, at least we got uh, glass formation, so we got uh, amorphous complexes. So this could be an interesting way to formulate such compounds. And then we did a discriminant analysis, looked at different FISCAM properties, and this uh, worked quite well to differentiate which compounds work as opposed to others that do not. So when you uh, plot the enthalpy of fusion and the log P, you actually can tear them a bit apart, the two types of systems. Now let's look a bit closer at these interactions that were also alluded to. So we did uh, some molecular dynamic simulation. Now one of the problems is that with MD simulations, you very often are ending in a local minimum. And you don't know if it's, uh, if it's really the global minimum or how many other minima exist. So what we did was a mixture of Monte Carlo simulations and MD simulations to really adequately sample the uh, conformational space and you see these non-covalent uh, binding that can be uh, across different binding energies, but it's, uh, it's overall not, of course, non-covalent. Then uh, I think it's an idea from Alex Aftif, but it was probably also mentioned earlier that phospholipids can be viewed as molecules with three regions of dielectric environment. There is a dielectric environment of the tail group, there is one of the head group, and one in between. And uh, based on our Monte Carlo and MD simulations, we're basically assigning the drugs according to where they interact to these different three classes. And this is what we did here. Some drugs appear twice if they really have not one very pronounced uh, global minimum, energy minimum, but rather appear uh, with different binding modes. All right, then. Let's move on to drug release. Um, we did the drug release here uh, with a UV imaging technique. In this case, there was no uh, lipase involved. We also do lipolysis testing, by the way. But we, what we wanted to see here was this dispersion. So the thing that works quite naturally in the self emulsifying systems, and which is also maybe one of the reasons why it is uh, a, an idea to use a complex also in a, in a, in a self-emulsifying system, because what we wanted to see here was this hydration. The first step is a hydration and a dispersion step, and from an amorphous complex, this can be a hurdle. So uh, that is what we looked at here, and uh, the blue diamonds are the, um, uh, the lyso, or monoacyl phosphatidylcholine, here in case of ferrosamide, that's panel A, and the lower one is for indomethacin. And uh, you see it's clearly the intrinsic dissolution rate as a function of time here is much higher than uh, the, green, uh, the green symbols that uh, hold for the diacyl phosphatidylcholine or then the red, which is just the, um, the drug. And um, 
I could show you also the other results, but they look very similar. So what we basically see is that the lyso uh, phosphatidylcholine really has an advantage with respect to hydration and dispersion kinetics. Yeah, and then, of course, you have the colloids that are formed. Uh, once again, it's very nice that you are setting the scene, Annette, with your <laughs> uh, talk. Uh, it's complex what you get. And, um, uh, and of course, also then in the GI tract, because don't forget, also what I shown earlier was in fascif. So there is also bile salts, there is torocolate as part of the fascif. So they interact and form together mixed colloids um, and they defined how much is also supersaturated in the end with these systems. Now, the last part, very briefly, of my talk is what kind of modeling do we actually have on that level, on the colloidal level? So, um, yeah, I think an interesting option is to use the uh, Cosmo RS theory. That's a conductor-like screening model for real solvents. We already talked about dielectric properties. So this is really where this uh, um, theory... Uh, kicks in. It's a quantum chemical, uh, cal based on quantum chemical calculations, DFT calculations, and then it uses the surface fragments for statistical thermodynamics. We used that before, for example, to predict drug solubility in glycerides. Uh, we had also a couple of other uh, applications, for example, in drug supersaturation to predict which polymer is the best. And um, yeah, there is the possibility to bring this to a colloidal level, and that is uh, an adapted version, the Cosmo MITS uh, model, where you basically first start with a molecular dynamics um, simulation, and that is the structure. It could be a vesicle, could be an entire liposome, and then you do the Cosmo RS calculations. And what do you get? Well, basically, you get the free energy along the phosph... Yeah, here, uh, for example, a bilayer, or it could be also just a, a micelle. From, the, from that information, you uh, actually learn about where is the drug residing in there. It's, of course, a different uh, size level than what we've seen earlier with the Monte Carlo and MD simulations. And from that point of view, also much more uh, realistic. And very interesting from the uh, probability distribution, you can predict a partition coefficient. Um, now, I'd love to also show you much more of these calculations and to compare with experimental data, but that's actually ongoing work. <laughs> so uh, that brings me already to, the, uh, to some of the take-home messages. So you've seen, not just from my talk, also from the previous talks, monoacyl phosphatidylcholine is a very uh, promising excipient. Yeah, in my case, and also for amphotericin B, obviously, and nilotinib, it seems to be very attractive to do amorphous, um, uh, amorphous complexes that can be also further used as intermediate for other lipid-based formulation. You've seen that in silico tools help us these days to guide formulators. Um, all of these formulations are not new, they're out there since a long time. So these phospholipid complexes, I had it on the first slide, they were initially used for um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and they have a long history. So this was way be before 2000 that they came out. So I think modern is to know when to use which type of uh, system. And that brings me to the last point. It's a bit of a personal comment. It's more than 20 years ago that I brought my formulations in my industrial years uh, to preclinical trials and also phospholipid formulations to clinical trials. And uh, yeah, I think these days we are much better equipped knowing with what works best for a specific compound with a given FIS chemistry. And why isn't that not more harnessed in these early uh, clinical trial? Because actually it was always working quite well. So with that, I'd like to thank um, uh, those who contributed also financially, uh, the Phospholipid uh, Research Foundation. And um, if you do not have enough of computational pharmaceutics, I'd like to draw your attention. There is also an EU project on computational pharmaceutics. So if you have spare two minutes, you can Google the InPharma network and there are a couple of very short videos that give you ideas and about, the, uh, about these individual projects. So thanks a lot.